alternatives. Order, should... Senator Van. You'll be in continuation upon resumption. Senator Cormann. Much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today uh, due to ministerial duties. Uh, in Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence, the Assistant Defence Minister, the Minister for Veterans uh, and Defence Personnel, and the Minister for Defence Industry. And uh, Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Last week, media reports revealed that security agencies had advised former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull not to attend a meet and greet function in February 2018 due to the associations of guests invited by Ms Liu. According to leaked pre-selection documents, Ms Liu claims to have raised in excess of $1 million for the Liberal Party. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to ensure himself that funds raised by Ms Liu are from appropriate sources and have been properly disclosed? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as I've indicated to the Chamber last week, uh, the Prime Minister has full confidence in the member for Chisholm. Uh, obviously, uh, questions uh, in relation to declarations of uh, political donations are a matter uh, for uh, party organisations. Uh, I will also note that the member for Chisholm uh, has uh, stated very clearly that at all times uh, she has complied uh, with relevant state and federal disclosure laws uh, and the Victorian uh, Division of the Liberal Party have also advised that all requirements have been complied with. This is just a continuation uh, of Labor's smear campaign last week. Uh, guess what? Uh, the member for Chisholm, who has been uh, a long time Liberal, uh, has a history of supporting the Liberal Party. I mean, you know, that's great news. I mean, let's, let's, let's stop the front pages. Let's stop the front pages. Uh, breaking news. Breaking news. Uh, the member for Chisholm, a long-term uh, member of the Liberal Party, has supported the Liberal Party before being elected by the people of Chisholm uh, as, a, as a member of parliament. And, uh, you know, indeed, uh, I mean, the Labor, the Labor Party uh, are now so desperate, they're now so desperate uh, that they continue to pursue this smear uh, suggesting through this, I mean, you know, this is this is all this is all this uh, this is all this dog whistle uh, little campaign because 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 Gladys Liu is born in Hong Kong uh, because she's a Chinese born Austra because she's a Chinese Australian uh, that she must be a spy. That order. is what this is all about. Senator, order, Senator Wong on a point of order. At a personal level, I would ask my colleague to withdraw. He knows that is not true. He knows that is a lie. On a line. I, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, sorry. That is a line. The only person will get up and have an argument about New South Wales, but you're accusing the Labor Party of dog whistling. The only person, the only person, the only person, the only person who is drawing a link between the cultural heritage of Ms. Liu. Yes, oh. I ask that it be withdrawn. Um, Oh, Senator Bernardi, on the point of order. Mr. President, this is not a point of order at all. I mean, Senator Wong has got up and made a number of statements. She hasn't drawn your attention to anything specific on or the, made any any particular point in regard on, to the standing orders. On the on on the point of order, oh, Senator Wong, on the point of order. I, I, I take the interjection from my colleague, Senator Bernardi. Senator, uh, there is an ad, uh, there is an imputation about members of this place that I ask be withdrawn. Um, I. We'll review the hand side about anything unparliamentary. Um, Senator Wong, um, and, and Senator Wong, on, on that, I, I provided you with an opportunity to, to put your case with some discretion to allow, as, as, as leader. I didn't detect anything unparliamentary in what the, the minister said. Um, I said last week that one of the precedents in this place is that for something to be unparliamentary and a reflection, it needs to be addressed to an individual. Uh, comments that people take offence at with, with respect to a party have not historically, in my memory, been taken to be unparliamentary, even if some people do would prefer they are not made. Now, Senator Wong, 
Um, well, last week I made the ruling, um, and I did check it afterwards, and no one has brought to my attention an example where claims against other parties have been deemed to be unparliamentary. Now, I'll review exactly what um, Senator Cormann said, but I did not hear anything unparliamentary then. On the point of order, there wasn't a point of order on direct relevance, and Senator Cormann's uh, at liberty to continue for 33 seconds. He's concluded his answer. Senator Gallagher. Order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. I have a supplementary. The Minister for Government Services, Stuart Roberts, told Sky News yesterday that Ms Liu is double-checking both the donations she has helped to raise for the party and her previous associations. What is the nature of this double-checking process? Senator Cormann. So, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the Labor Party is running a bit slow behind, uh, obviously, the evolving events. Uh, as I have indicated in response to the primary question, uh, the member for Chisholm has made it very clear that at all times she has complied with relevant state and federal disclosure laws. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. I have a supplementary too. Order. Order. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. To, ins to ensure the integrity of Ms. Liu's double checking, will the Prime Minister require Ms. Liu to make a full statement detailing the results of the so called double checking to the Parliament? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Liu made a statement uh, last week, which was tabled in the Parliament last week. Oh. Order. Senator Direct relevance. This is not about a past statement. This is about a statement about the process that a government minister is asserting shows that she's all clear. The question goes to whether or not the government will ensure Ms Liu makes a statement to the parliament Se about this so-called double-checking process. The, the point of order is direct relevance. A past statement is not relevant to a future one. Um, uh, with respect, Senator Wong, um, the minister had been speaking for five seconds. Um, I'm not a mind reader. I'm going to allow the minister time to answer the question. And, but on the point, I do actually, if a, if a minister is asked, if a minister, order. I, I'm just going to try and rule on the point of order. If a minister is asked about a future statement, I disagree, Senator Wong. I think drawing attention to a past statement, while it may not be the preferred answer, is actually directly relevant to answering that question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, uh, you know, the Labor Party wants to go with this uh, approach of guilty unless proven innocent. Uh, like this, the, 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 member, the, the member for Chisholm has been very clear. If the Labor Party has got any specific, if the Labor Party has got any specific allegations, if, they, if they've got any specific evidence, they should put it. And let me say, responding uh, to uh, you know Senator uh, Wong's uh, your previous comments, let me tell you, and I won't mention any names. But running into lots of Labor backbenchers at the airport on Thursday, let me tell you, there lo there's lots of concern on your backbench about your approach to this issue. Senator, order. Senator, order. I order. It's Monday. I have allowed a little discretion for people to get used to the chamber. Order. Can people, ho Senator Wong? Order. We're wasting question time, which I know the opposition considers a forum for um, non-government parties. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Can the minister outline how the government is taking action to provide certainty and stability to small businesses, workers, and subcontractors by ensuring registered organisations? Play by the rules. The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz uh, for his very important question. Because, Mr. President, we've seen through multiple royal commissions, we've seen how often the law-breaking culture that lies at the heart of some registered organisations that simply refuse to play by the rules. The CFMMEU, for Order. example, Mr. President, an organisation very familiar to members opposite, has breached industrial laws alone three times per week, on average over the course of the last 15 Senator years. Senator Watt. Your glass jaw is showing, Senator Watt. Racking up $16.4 million in court ordered penalties for more than 2,100 offences. Just last week, Mr. President, we heard Justice Mortimer of the Federal Court observe the following when imposing yet another fine on the CFMMEU. 
He said the CFMMEU appears undeterred by whatever penalties are fixed by this court for its contraventions. He also observed that continuing to impose fines on the CFMMEU in the hope that it will have a deterrent effect appears to me to be engaging in something of a fiction. It's clear that existing deterrents are not working, and that's why this government has introduced the Ensuring Integrity yeah. Bill. This bill is designed to target organisations and individuals that fail to take seriously both the privileges and responsibilities arising out of registration or appointment as an officer and who continue to break the law with reckless abandon. The bill, which applies equally to all registered organisations, be they unions or employer organisations, introduces basic yeah. standards of behaviour for such organisations and their officials. It will assist in deterring repeated law breaking through the imposition of tougher penalties by the courts. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the minister: Is the minister aware whether the CFMEU was the former employer of uh, the leader of the opposition in this place? But more seriously, can the minister update the Senate on the sorts of conduct that gives rise to the government's action? Senator Payne. Thank you Senator very much, Watt. Mr President. I can advise the Senate yeah. that in recent years the CFMMEU and its officials have been found by the courts to have firstly unlawfully pressured workers to join the union and give up their own wages in union fees, secondly kicked workers off job sites for refusing to join the union, thirdly engaged in costly, time-consuming and unlawful industrial action that hinders the completion of vital construction projects and ultimately costs taxpayers. Mr. President. Fourthly, made up safety complaints to unlawfully gain access to work sites. And finally, intimidated and harassed female public servants, including police. And if that weren't enough, Mr. President, just this weekend we saw reports of Mr. Setka making threatening remarks about sitting senators, about colleagues in this chamber. That sort of behaviour is totally inexcusable and beyond defensible. Doesn't matter whether they're construction workers or small businesses, senators or otherwise. No one should be forced to do anything Order. under the threat of Senator retribution Payne. from a militant union or Senator its officials. Senator Abetz, a final I, supplementary I thank question. the minister for her answer. Is the minister aware of any alternative views that risk besmirching the good name and actions of our nation's many law-abiding registered organisations? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I can, in fact, because those views which are held by those opposite who, despite all the evidence, the court decisions, comments by the judiciary, the repeated examples of outrageous, unlawful behaviour, continue to see fit to defend lawbreakers and to oppose this government's bill. They refuse to acknowledge that the problems run deeper than one man, however disgraceful his behaviours might be. They refuse to drop their policy to scrap the ABCC, something they committed to because they promised the CFMMEU even less oversight. They're engaging in a protection racket of repeat lawbreakers in unions like the CFMMEU who continue to give the rest of the union movement a bad name. And it leads you to wonder why, Mr. President. Why would those opposite be doing that? Is it because they support lawbreaking? Is it because they uh, they have personal links that uh, that they can't get past? Or is it because they receive millions of dollars from the offices, from the coffers of lawbreaking organisations like the CFMEU into Order. their accounts Senator every Payne, single time year? Time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Last week, the Prime Minister repeatedly referred to a statement by Ms Liu, but refused to assure the Parliament and the Australian people that she is a fit and proper person to sit as a member of the Australian Parliament. Is the Prime Minister prepared to declare to the Parliament that Ms Liu is a fit and proper person to be a member of the Australian Parliament? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Liu was validly elected as a member for Chisholm, and the Prime Minister has full confidence in her. Like th th this, this, this question, this, this question the Labour Party is asking here, uh, Mr. President, should actually be ruled out of order because, quite frankly, I mean, there is only there is this is you, 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 this is this is just part of the Labour Party trickery. This is just part of the Labour Party trickery. You are so. You're still, as I said last week, you're still going through your seven stages of grief. 
You're still going through your seven stages of grief. Uh, you, are still, you still haven't accepted that you lost the last election. You still haven't accepted that you lost uh, the uh, seat of uh, Chisholm and you thought you already had it in your bag. Uh, you didn't. You, you, uh, you, you are accusing, you're accusing Ms. Liu of uh, things that, of course, uh, you know, if, if there is that, you, you're accusing her of being part of organisations that your Labour candidate was a member of. And then on, on the weekend, we had this, a massive, uh, this uh, amazing diversion, this amazing attempt at a diversion uh, by the leader of the opposition, where he says, oh, that shouldn't really matter because you know, the Labour candidate was Taiwanese. Well, I mean, we are not actually accusing anyone of uh, having done anything wrong by being part of these organisations. I mean, we think it's normal that Australians of Chinese origin are involved in Chinese community organisations. It's only the Labour Party that is trying to run a smear and, you know, whatever way you want to put it, uh, the imputation of what you're saying is you're trying to get the message out to the Australian people that the Labour Party thinks that Ms Liu is a, is a spy. That is, that is the accusation that you're running and whatever way, that, that is, and you're not, you're, not naive, you're not saying it, you're not using the words, but that is what you're trying to spread. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Last week, Ministers Corman and Payne refused to assure the Senate that Ms Liu is a fit and proper person to be a member of the Australian Parliament on four occasions. Minister, will you do so now? Senator Corman. Uh, well, uh, again, um, the Prime Minister has full confidence, full confidence in the member for Chisholm. Order. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. One government MP is quoted in media reports as saying, there should have been concerns when she was being chosen to stand as a candidate, and I believe those concerns were ignored. Given members of the government hold concerns about Ms Liu, why is the Prime Minister refusing to allow her to make a statement to the parliament? Senator Coleman. Oh, another news flash. Something else that would never have happened on the uh, Labor side. There's competition in pre-selections. There's competition in pre-selections. Oh, in political parties, we've got competition. And there's, and there's some people that might have been on the losing side of a contest. Oh, oh, let's have another front page. Maybe we should put that on the, splash that on the Australian front page tomorrow. I mean, the Labor Party here, you are grasping at straws. You are so desperate. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable that you haven't got anything more important to go on about other than a newly elected member of parliament who had a bad interview. Order. On relevance, the minister only has 30 seconds left. The question was quite specific about things that government MPs have said. He has been speaking about pre-selection candidates. By the Senator, very nature, he's Senator not answering Kenneally, the question. It's uh, about the, government the MPs. The minister has concluded his answer. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister inform the Senate how a strong budget helps create stability and certainty for young Australians to help them get off welfare and into work through the Youth Jobs Path Program? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I say thank you to Senator Stoker for what is a very important question. Mr. President, this is a government that is committed to getting people off welfare and into work. The greatest thing you can do for someone is to find them a job, and we have a very specific focus on getting our young people off welfare and into work. We have a Youth Jobs Path program. This is all about prepare, trial and hire, and it's focusing on giving our young people who want to work the skills that they require to actually get into the workforce really importantly, the opportunity to have a go in the workplace, because so many of these young people, the feedback they give us is, we want to get a job, however, we have not been able to get a foot in the door, and that is exactly what the PATH program does. But we're also giving employers the incentive to hire and to continue to invest in this particular young person. Mr President, since being introduced in 2017, the government's Youth Jobs Path program has helped over 50,000 young job seekers into work. That's 50,000 young Australians who would otherwise be reliant on welfare. That is 50,000 young Australians who have the chance of a fulfilling career, something they tell us that is exactly what they want, and 50,000 young Australians 
who are helping to avoid the trap that is long-term unemployment. But, Mr. President, what we're now doing is we're going to expand the Youth Jobs Path program to include yeah. path industry pilots. And what we're going to do is work directly with industry and give industry the direct opportunity to provide input, training, matching and support for young job seekers. This is a government that is committed to getting our youth off welfare and Order. into work. Senator, Cash. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Is the minister aware of any examples of success stories arising from the Youth Jobs Path Program? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the things that is so fantastic about this portfolio is you actually meet people whose lives have been tra transformed by government programs. One such example is Jamea Paul. She's actually a young Indigenous woman, and Senator Stoker, she's from your great state, which is from the Gold Coast. She's landed a job as an apprentice mechanic with the help of the government's Youth Jobs Path program. She undertook employability skills training with a training specialist. The specialist, along with her job active provider, then helped her secure a path internship with a motor mechanic on the, Gulf, uh, the Gold Coast. Following the internship, Mr. President, Janaya was offered an apprenticeship with the mechanics firm. She is now one of a number of growing female motor mechanics in Australia, and this is the message that she has for other women. Being a female in a male-dominated industry, it can be daunting, but go get it. It's the best decision I've ever made. This is a government Order. that is committed. Senator Cash, Let's time get people the off answer welfare has expired. And... Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware of any alternate approaches to getting young Australians into work? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And unfortunately, those opposite, those who are members of the Labor Party, actually went to the last election, colleagues, with a policy to abolish the Youth Jobs Path program. On this side of the chamber, we are committed to getting people off welfare and into work. We are committed in particular to getting our young people off welfare and into work and giving them every opportunity that we can to get those skills that they require before they can even get a foot in the door, to actually give them that opportunity for internship. Because so many of them say to us, we want to put our hand up and work. But guess what, Mr President? Because they don't have that experience, they're not able to get that foot in the door. And this is exactly what the PATH program is able to do for them. Give them the skills they need, give them that opportunity to undertake an internship, get that foot in the door, and then we encourage employers to take them on and invest in them. Before I come to you, Senator Hanson Young, I'll briefly acknowledge former Senator Edwards, who's joined us in the gallery today. Welcome back. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Um, Minister, the Murray Darling Basin is in crisis. The environment is in collapse. Communities are on the brink of having no clean drinking water. Family farms have their backs against the wall. And the Water Minister says he doesn't even believe in climate change. And he says he can't do anything except pray for rain. When will the Morrison government get its head out of the sand on climate change and come to tackle the drought rather than just praying for rain and giving communities your hopes and prayers? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, firstly, our government, of course, is uh, committed to effective action on climate change. Not only are we on track to meet and exceed uh, the emissions reduction targets uh, uh, signed on to uh, in Kyoto. Uh, we also have a plan to meet uh, our emissions reduction targets uh, to 2030 agreed to in Paris. Uh, in relation to the Murray-Darling Basin, the government is committed to delivering the Murray-Darling Basin plan and, and, of course, to ensure benefits flow to communities, farmers and the environment. Uh, we, have, we have achieved a lot, but we acknowledge the Basin uh, plan uh, isn't perfect. Reversing the effects of the past 100 years of management will take time. But the bison isn't just a source of precious water, it's our food bowl. Almost half our um, irrigated agriculture production comes from the bison. It's home uh, to more than two million people and supports tens of thousands of businesses. So uh, we are committed to effective action on climate change. We're committed to effective imp implementation of the bison plan, but we do understand that it takes time uh, to reverse uh, 100 years of, uh, previous, of previous decision making. 
Senator Hanson Young, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. When will the government develop a drought plan that actually includes climate change and deals with the overextraction by big corporate irrigation and the gaming of the system by big, rich water barons? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I reject the premise of the question, and uh, I put it to Senator Hanson Young uh, that our plan, both on climate change and uh, on the Murray oh, sorry, Darling Senator Basin. Senator Hanson Young, on a point of order. I'll... Uh, just like, um, uh, just a clarification: is the does, is the minister saying they don't have a drought plan at all? Senator Hanson Young, that's not a point of order. Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. President, I absolutely reject the accusations that were included in that question, and uh, I put it to Senator Hanson Young, as I do to the Senate, that the government uh, is implementing a, an appropriately balanced uh, plan to effectively address climate change and an appropriately balanced plan uh, to appropriately deal with the issues uh, faced uh, in the Murray Darling Basin. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. No drought plan, no climate plan. For six years, the National Party have been in charge of water policy in this country. How bad does it need to get? How bad does it need to get before the Prime Minister takes the water portfolio off the Nationals? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. That is a, that is a ridiculous proposition. Uh, the the uh, Liberal National Party is a strong coalition, and we've got outstanding uh, National Party colleagues uh, who have performed responsibilities uh, for the water portfolio and. And, and, and none, and none more so than the uh, current uh, minister with responsibility for water, uh, Minister Minister Little Proud. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, President, you know, while there is, uh, you know, all, there's always noise, while, while people throw rocks, we just continue to get on with doing the job that needs doing. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can you please advise the Senate how many times Prime Minister Morrison referred to former Senator Dastyari as Shanghai Sam? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I take that question on notice. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When the Prime Minister was asked on Friday, and I quote, why was it racist to question Gladys Liu's connection to China, but it wasn't racist to call Sam Dastyari Shanghai Sam, the Prime Minister replied, and I quote, I didn't use either of those phrases. Given the Prime Minister used the term Shanghai Sam at least 17 times, why did the Prime Minister deny using the term? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I've already taken the primary question on notice, so I'm not going to accept the assertion that is made. What I would say is that there's absolutely no equivalence between uh, the circumstances uh, that. <laughs> The circumstances of uh, former Senator Dastyari. I mean, former Senator Dastyari, uh, former Senator Dastyari uh, gave uh, uh, advice to a foreign national that he was likely to be bugged, and then gave counter surveillance advice. Uh, he gave a press conference. He gave a press conference uh, in, like in the official Commonwealth parliamentary order. offices. Order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance. I simply asked why the Prime Minister denied using a term when he self-evidently had. On the point of order, oh, on the point of order point Senator Cormann. I, I, think, I think that um, Senator Wong, for obvious reasons, is incompletely uh, referencing her question. Uh, Senator Wong did more than that. Senator Wong, uh, in relation to the uh, first part of the question, I had already taken it on notice, in relation to the second part of the question, she sought to create an equivalence between uh, Senator, former Senator Dastyari and Ms Liu, and I was explaining why there is no such equivalence. If I could rule on the point of order, last week, order. Last week, I made the, or in the point of, I was going to rule on the point of order, Senator Wong. I, if I may, on yes, the point Senator of order, Wong. Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, the, the equivalence that I quoted was in the journalist's question to the Prime Minister. They were not my words. Uh, and, and the point, the question is about why the Prime Minister didn't tell the truth. I made the observation last week in question time that I believe the term I used was a glancing comment on other activities were appropriate to be directly relevant. But in this context, this subject matter was specifically introduced in the question, and I believe it, the, the minister is being directly relevant by addressing um, former Senator Dastyari because it was introduced in the question, whereas last week I ruled that 
a glancing comment but it not being the focus of the answer was more appropriate to be directly relevant. So in this case I think Senator Cormann is being directly relevant. So, so we're getting to the nub of the question here because I mean the Labor Party is trying to create this equivalence and there is no equivalence. I mean former Senator Dastiari took money for himself personally. He then went off uh, and gave a press conference with a foreign national in Commonwealth parliamentary offices in front of the Australian flags in front and like behind the Commonwealth crest announcing that there should be a change in Australian foreign policy, bipartisan foreign policy, in relation to China. And then he gave not only, not only did he warn Senator the Cormann, foreign national that he urge, was likely to Order, Senator Cormann. Time, can I urge senators to be uh, the rules about parliamentary language apply as much to interjections as they do to um, things that in informal speeches. So I can urge parliament members, uh, senators to keep that in mind. Senator Wong. Ask the Minister representing the Prime Minister, why did the Prime Minister mislead the Australian people? Will he now correct the record and explain his actions to the <laughs> Parliament? And to assist the Senator, I seek leave to table documents showing the 17 times Mr Morrison used the phrase he then denied to the Australian people he used. Leave is not granted. There, there, are, there, are, there are basic long-standing courtesies. On the, on, Senator, Order on my left. Senator Wong well understands the long-standing basic courtesies about tabling of documentation. I think Senator Wong is very well aware of this, and this is just a stunt. I've already taken the primary question uh, on notice, uh, and if uh, Senator Wong observes the usual uh, courtesies, of course uh, we will consider uh, providing leave later. Order, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people Order. of Queensland and Australia, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Last Friday, I wrote this letter to the Minister for Water Resources, Mr. David Littleproud. Dear Minister, I am writing to you to urgently request the release of 200 gigalitres of water from the Commonwealth Environmental Water Reserves currently being held in Hume and Doubtmouth dams. The purpose of the release is to allow additional irrigation allocations to water rights holders along the Murray River in southern New South Wales and northern Victoria. Without this water, crops currently in the ground will fail and rural communities will be adversely affected. That 200 gigalitres, Mr uh, Minister, represents a measly 5 to 7 per cent of water in Hume and Dartmouth dams with spring snow melt yet to come. As Minister for Agriculture, do you support my request for immediate release of this emergency water to farmers in your state and in New South Wales to stop their crops from dying. Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources and the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just want to clarify my being asked as the Minister for Agriculture or the Minister representing the Minister for Water. I interpreted that as a question directed as you representing the Minister for Water, with Senator Roberts opening comment. Agriculture. Okay, sorry. My I misheard in that case. Set the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, obviously, um, I know it's been a busy weekend for uh, National Party MPs and senators with our federal conference. So I'm sure Minister Littleproud uh, will be getting to the details of your letter, uh, Senator, through you, Mr. President, uh, this week. Uh, what we do support on this side of the chamber, and I'm sure. <laughs> all of parliament is that uh, Australian irrigators, Australian farmers uh, can continue to produce. It is incredibly tough out there, and that is one thing we did here at the National Party Federal Conference over the weekend, particularly in Queensland, New South Wales and sections of Victoria. The two million Australians that live in the Murray-Darling Basin, the majority of those are producing the food and fibre uh, of our country that we export around the world, and they're doing incredibly tough because of the drought. And so whilst the Murray-Darling Basin plan is in the process of being implemented, 80 per cent of it has been implemented thus far, uh, and there's a lot of discussion around, obviously, uh, the CHU and how some of those environmental holdings can be used, and a lot of different um, ideas, I guess, around how to uh, use that water, particularly in tough times such as the drought, which we're going through. Um, and those questions should be appropriately addressed to the Minister for the Environment, because, as you know, Senator Roberts, through you, Mr President, um, it is Susan Lay, the Minister for Environment, that has ministerial responsibility uh, for the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. I asked, Mr. President, I asked, as Minister for Agriculture, do you support my request for immediate release? I got a lot of fluff about Murray-Darling Basin and droughts and so on. I would have thought, Minister, 
that as Minister for Agriculture, it is your duty to make the urgent and immediate needs of des desperate farmers paramount. Why did you not do so? Senator McKenzie. Uh, Mr President, uh, farmers that are going through drought right now are doing it incredibly tough. That is why our government has put $7 billion worth of measures uh, into the communities, onto the tables of the farmers, obviously having a loan, suite of loans available to our primary producers for restocking and replanting. We've got additional mental health support going into those affected communities. Right across the board, our government's taking the drought incredibly seriously. So for you to stand up and somehow say that we don't get it and we aren't standing by our farming communities is absolutely misrepresenting what the government is doing. It is why the Prime Minister made it his first order of business. It's why he stood with the premiers, Labor premiers and Liberal premiers, uh, when he first became Prime Minister and called the National Drought Summit, so that together we can underpin the productive capacity of our regional communities who are struggling with drought. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Twice I've asked, do you support my request? So let me try a, third, a second question. Farmers and communities in northern Victoria and southern New South Wales are in dire straits yet cannot take water from the Murray, while Murray water is currently flooding the Paracuta State Forest. Would you, as Minister for Agriculture, prefer the water to flood the State Forest or go to farmers to produce a crop this year to save communities and farms from ruin? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Just to be crystal clear for the senator. The Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder is an independent statutory body held under the Minister of Environment's portfolio. I, as the Minister for Agriculture, cannot direct an independent statutory body uh, to do anything other than what it should do, which it is to uh, manage the water it holds uh, according to the Water Act. Um, in terms of my support as Minister for Agriculture for regional communities to have access to water, obviously I want to see them have uh, access to as much water as possible. I wish it would rain. I you know, want, to see, want to see dams full. I want to see dams full. I want to see water, not just environmentally watering environmental assets, but for use uh, but in productive capacity. That's what we all want to see. 80 per cent of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has been implemented, and uh, I think the discussions at the conference on uh, the weekend were very useful in what Order. other changes we Senator could make McKenzie. around the tube. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please advise the Senate how the Morrison government is delivering stability and certainty for the support provided to our unpaid carers who help those with disability age, mental illness or long-term physical illness? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much. And can I thank um, Senator Hughes for the question and understanding your long-term personal interest uh, in carers in Australia? Because we all know that our unpaid carers provide an absolutely invaluable contribution to society. Every day, 2.7 million Australians actually care for somebody who requires a little extra help. And we believe, the Morrison government believes, that it is absolutely important that we continue to provide the assistance to those carers to enable them to continue that very, very important role. Um, just recently, we have introduced the largest ever reform to carer services in more than a decade. Last month, we announced um, $493 million uh, for 10 not-for-profit organisations to roll out a very detailed and integrated carer support network across the whole of Australia. We did this because we had a strong budget that enabled us to do it. But can I acknowledge um, that through the Carers Gateway that this was actually an initiative designed by carers for, for carers and thank Carers Australia and their subsidiary organisations and particularly thank Ara Creswell, the CEO of Carers Australia, for the extraordinary effort that she and her team put in to working with the government to deliver, develop this proposal. Um, it's a fundamental shift away from the crisis-driven system that we've had in the past, and it's about putting intervention prevention and early intervention, particularly when it comes to respite, at the very forefront of this particular initiative. We believe that it's important that we get in there and help carers before they reach crisis point and not after the crisis has befallen them. So by 2022, uh, these reforms will have delivered a five-fold increase in the number of support services for carers across Australia. That's from 130,000 instance, 130, instances to 700,000 interested. 
This is an example of the Morrison government providing stability and certainty, delivering on our promises and helping Australians Order. help Senator themselves. Russen. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, will our unpaid carers continue to receive support services during the transition to the new carer gateway? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely. Existing service delivery will overlap with the new services to ensure continuity and a smooth transition to the new uh, improved services. As I said, this new model is a model that was designed by carers for carers, um, and we want to make sure our unpaid carers can be assured that they will be able to continue to access the kind of support that they have in their local area. But we also want to make sure that not only will they be able to get that support, but also, in most instances, better support. Um, service providers um, are required to ensure that unpaid carers will receive at least like-for-like -like services uh, and probably uh, improved services in their local area. Um, our reforms, as I said, have been co-designed with the industry peak body, Carers Australia. And in the words of the Chief Executive of uh, Carers Australia, Mazaru uh, Ara Creswell, uh, the new regional network of service providers will play a significant part in delivering necessary supports for Australia's family and friend carers, providing Order. an increased Senator range Rushton, of service types and expired. improved access. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What impact will these reforms have on the provision of respite for carers? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and a very important question from Senator Hughes. Um, we understand the importance of accessing respite care because we understand that people do need a break. And that's why we've invested almost $500 million in these reforms that, as I said, will deliver a five-fold increase in the kind of support that is able to be provided to our carers. Um, this investment includes an $84.3 million investment in the 2019-2020 uh, budget to increase respite service for carers and to provide more support, particularly for young carers. The funding uh, provides for additional complementary short-term and emergency respite for carers because we recognise the interdependency between the, carers, uh, the needs of carers but also the needs of the people who care for them. Uh, we understand that only a strong budget and a responsible budget can deliver this for our unpaid carers, and we will provide the certainty and stability to enable unpaid carers to continue their valuable Order. work. Senator Rustin. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Prime Minister failed to assure the parliament last week that Ms Liu was a fit and proper person. Why? Senator Cormann. Very much, Mr. President. Uh, the, the Prime Minister refused to play Labor's word Order. games. The Prime Minister has made very clear that he has that he has full confidence in the member for Chisholm, as did a majority of uh, of um, voters in the seat of Chisholm, which is, of course, what this is all about. I mean, the Labor Party thinks that this is somehow a backdoor way uh, to turn back the verdict of the Australian people at the last election. This is this is what this is all about, because, of course, the core accusation that Order. Labor levelled. At, uh, the, at Ms. Liu is to be is to be a member of an organisation or a number of organisations that the Labour candidate was a member of too. That was a member of too. Do you think that the Labour Party would be asking these questions if the Labour candidate had provided the last election? Of course not. This is a transparent, politically opportunist attack, and it is and it is. I mean, the, the implication of what uh, Labour here is suggesting. Everybody knows what the implication is that you're trying to get up without actually saying so. That is why I say that you are guilty of a disgraceful exercise in dog whistling. You know precisely what you're doing, and there are many on the Labour side that are embarrassed by the judgments that the leadership of the Labour Party has made in relation to this. Order. Order. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister has refused. Order, the, Senator Wong. I can't hear Senator Kitching. The, Senator Wong. The Senator Prime, Kitching. The Prime Minister has refused to require Ms. Liu to make a statement to the Parliament. Why? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Again, I mean the, the Labor Party is, uh, you know, pursuing this. Uh, uh, a conspiracy theory, which uh, doesn't do them any credit at all. Ms. Liu made a order. statement. Order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. He got there. Uh, Ms. Ms. Oh. Liu made a statement last week. It was tabled in the parliament. It has got the force of uh, being tabled in the parliament uh, in her name. I mean, this is just more of Labour Party games. Order, order. Senator Kitching, a sub final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
The Prime Minister misled the Australian people on his use of the term Shanghai Sam. Why? Senator Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, that question uh, relies on a, an assertion uh, that I have, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, that I've taken on notice. And so uh, I, will get, I will get back to the Senate once I've. Uh, Order. Once I've I, Order. Well, you know, if, I don't know why you're asking a question if you think that you know the answer. Senator if you think that you know the answer, then why are you asking a question? Uh, I will, I've taken it on notice, and I will ensure that the answer that I provide to the Senate is accurate. Order. Order on my left, Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister please update the Senate on what the Liberal and Nationals Coalition Government is doing to ensure that the ABC's charter and governance arrangements formally recognise obligations to rural and regional communities. Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator McMahon, for your answer. I know your uh, territory was severely impacted by decisions made by former managing director in the ABC board when they uh, got rid of the shortwave radio. Uh, so this is an important question to yours. No, actually it wasn't. Please read Senator McCarthy's uh, actual Senate inquiry into the issue. The Liberal National Government know the importance of the ABC to rural and regional communities. It provides local voices talking about local issues. It covers the good, like thrilling local sporting derbies, the bad, the stresses that local communities are under because of the drought and the downright ugly, broadcasting our emergency service information to keep locals informed and safe in bushfires and in floods, as they're currently doing. That's why it's so important that regional Australia has a say in how the ABC is run, because decisions made by a city-centric board and management centre Order. means that services end up getting cut to the very people where the ABC is often the only provider of entertainment, information and current affairs. Senator um, O'Neill. So that is why our government is seeking to legislate changes to ensure the ABC is responsive to the needs of rural and regional Australia, amending the charter to include regional and geographic diversity, establishing an advisory council so that the ABC board, before they actually make decisions that impact on service provision, actually bothers to consult those impacted, because we know they haven't in the past. Annual reporting obligations and ensuring the ABC board itself has connections into regional Australia. This is just one example of how our government is focused on the needs of regional Australians, because we believe geography should not be a determinant of your future success. Order. I'm going to ask senators that when I call them to order by name, they at least count to 20 before they interject again. Senator McMahon. Thank you. Uh, what measures is the government proposing to ensure that the Regional Advisory Council is representative of rural and regional Australia? Senator McKenzie. Well, in my previous role as Minister for Decentralisation, I probably just should have decentralised Ultimo uh, out to the regions and we wouldn't even be needing this le le piece of legislation, but didn't quite get there. Look, the uh, Regional Advisory Council is to be established within three months of the bill uh, becoming law. And the Council's role will be to reflect and consult with regional Australia when the board is actually making decisions on service provision. We had the shortwave decision, which saw the NT uh, basically without ABC services outside of Darwin, Alice Springs and Catherine. It was just shocking. People on station could not actually listen to the national broadcaster that receives a billion dollars worth of public funds. And over time, the ABC has had numerous examples of cutting services and consolidating staff into capital cities. The bill will also require the ABC board to have at least two appointees who have a deep connection to rural Order, and regional Senator Australia. McKenzie. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister please detail what reporting obligations will the ABC have to ensure that these measures are being met? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. 
These changes are all about making sure rural and regional Australia's interests are better represented in the ABC's governance structures. It's important to have a metric to, number one, make sure uh, that changes are implemented in a timely way, and number two, to make sure rural and regional voices are heard and listened to in ABC management decisions. The bill will introduce a number of additional annual reporting obligations to the ABC because I find if you're actually going to have to report something publicly, it will actually help you focus the mind on, how, on the impact of your decisions. The ABC will have to provide statistics on the number of people employed in regional and metropolitan areas. This will include details on the number of journalists employed in regional areas as well as the total number of hours of local or regional news bulletins broadcast each year. This is incredibly important for transparency. The ABC is an important news and entertainment service to our community, and we want to make sure that continues. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator, order, Senator McKim. On both sides of the chamber, Senator McKim is on his feet. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Cash, representing the Minister for Home Affairs. Home Affairs Minister Dutton told 2GB Radio last week that Nardes, the father of the family from Biloela that your government is currently detaining on Christmas Island, had travelled internationally from Australia while his matter was still before the courts. Minister, can you confirm that in fact Nardes did not travel from Australia while his matter was before the courts and that anyway, under his visa conditions, he would not have been allowed to return to Australia if, in fact, he had left. The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McKim for the question. In relation to those details, Senator McKim, I will need to take them on notice and revert to you. Uh, but in relation to this more broadly, Senator McKim, um, the only reason these people, as you know, are actually on or in this particular situation is because of the policies that you supported uh, the last time were the Labor Party were in power. This is all about a failure to protect our borders, and the situation which is currently playing out is a direct result of a policy failure by the former Labor government in conjunction and supported by the Australian Greens. Uh, the minister has made it abundantly clear in relation to this particular family's case. Mr President, it has been comprehensively assessed over many, many years. You will have heard the minister say they have gone on to appeal to the Federal Magistrates Court, the Federal Court and the High Court. Mr President, the highest court in our land has found against these people. They have every single step of the way explained, have explained to them their circumstances to every decision maker and judge, and every single one of them, every single one of them, Mr. President, has rejected their claim for protection. That is, even though the Australian Greens do not like this, what that means is that they are not refugees. Mr. President, but again, in relation to this situation, it goes back to a fundamental failure to protect our borders, and this government has made it very clear, and this minister and the Prime Minister, who is the former minister, have made it very, very clear. Australia's border protection will always Order. come first. Senator Cash, Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Well, um, thank you, President. Talk about uh, leading with your chin, Minister. Uh, can you confirm that you've just misled the Senate by claiming that the High Court found against the Biloela family when, in fact, there was no appeal heard in the High Court? Secondly, have you misled the Senate in the claim you just made uh, when you said the courts had rejected this family's claim for protection when, in fact, these matters were not merits-based assessments. Order. They were Senator simply McKim, assessments of the court, and the, the process has had been expired. Fired. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I completely reject the premise of Senator McKim's uh, question. As I have stated, Mr. President, as the Prime Minister has stated, and as the Minister okay. himself has stated on numerous occasions now, the family's case has been comprehensively assessed 
Over many years, they have gone on to appeal to the Federal Magistrates Court, the Federal Court and the High Court. And on every single occasion, they have explained their circumstances to every decision maker and judge, and every one of them has rejected their claim for protection. Senator McKim does not like a government that puts the security of its nation and the security of its people at the forefront of government policy. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Minister, why are you currently misleading the Senate about this matter? Why does why did the minister use that TGB interview uh, to denigrate the Biloela family by putting false information on the record and by the use of the racially loaded term anchor babies? Is this your consistent tactic Order. of denigrating refugees in this country for political purposes? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I would expect nothing more and nothing less from I'll Senator McKim in terms sorry. of his attitude and the attitude of the Australian Greens towards border protection. Senator McKim, I completely reject uh, the premise of your question. The minister is possibly, along with the Prime Minister, the toughest ministers when it comes to border protection this country has ever seen. Senator McKim, the failure Order. of your party's policies in, in supporting the Australian Labor Party the last time that they they were in power, led to in excess of 50,000 people coming here illegally by boat. Led to, Mr. President, quite just alarmingly, 1,200 people that we know of Order. perishing at sea. They also, if you recall, despite the high moral ground that they like to take, had no problem in seeing children locked up in detention. This is a direct consequence of a failure to protect Australia's borders. Order. Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Birmingham. Analysis from JP Morgan shows that under the Morrison government's energy crisis, power prices continue to go up and up and up. Can the minister confirm that electricity prices have risen across the four national electricity market states Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales and Queensland, up to $83 per megawatt hour in August, up 12 per cent from June, despite lower demand. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank the Senator for, uh, for his question. Uh, Mr President, uh, our government has been working across a range of fronts to ensure that energy prices are contained and come down. And what we've seen is that there are, there are emerging signs in some quarters of Order. price relief in terms of consumers being able to access lower energy prices. Uh, consumers, of course, who find Senator themselves Watt. on default plans now find that without question uh, they are in a position to enjoy better deals as a result of the reforms that this government has put in place. The reforms we've put in place in relation to the gouging that has occurred Senator in terms of gold plating of infrastructure and the like, again, are about keeping prices as low as possible into the future. Now, these reforms across the board, whether it relates to retail, Order. generation Ayers or transmission— Mr President, relevance. I was hoping that the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions would answer the question. Um, I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. I believe the minister is being directly relevant if he's talking about prices, because that was the nature of your question, Senator Ayres, but I can't instruct him as to the content or how to answer it. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr President. And, uh, uh, the reality that, uh, is that we found and encountered prices that were absolutely escalating far too high, far too quickly, hurting households and businesses across the country. The action we've taken as a government, whether it is in terms of generation reforms to encourage new generation to put stability into the grid, both in terms of, trans of uh, generation as well as prices, uh, to reform transmission and to change market rules to stop the type of gouging we've seen in terms of transmission, as well as in particular the retail reforms that ensure Australians, Australians don't get pushed onto default contracts that are unfair and take advantage of those who are most vulnerable are reforms that are benefiting Australians and will continue to provide price relief in terms of the type of increases that have been experienced in the past not being repeated again into the future. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. 
Can the minister confirm that forward prices are now 29 per cent higher than a year ago, averaging $94 a megawatt hour? Why are they so much more? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, uh, I don't accept the, uh, the data that, uh, that the senator is necessarily quoting there, and particularly when you look at the retail prices that consumers and businesses are paying, the contracts that consumers and businesses are able to access. Ultimately, what matters here, what matters here is what people pay on their electricity bill, and the electricity bills for Australians are improving relative to where they would have been thanks to the reforms of our government, thanks to the reforms ensuring that people have more transparent choice, better default conditions and that the energy market operates more effectively as a result of these reforms. Senator Eyre has a final supplementary question. It's basically over. Why is the government engaging in smug self-congratulation when Australian families are struggling with electricity prices higher than ever before? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, if you look at, for example, those most vulnerable Australians who find themselves on default market schemes, those, those Australians are an estimated $190 better off as a result of the reforms to the way the default market, the way the default market schemes operate. Now, Senator Wong may not like that fact, but of course she was quite happy to sit there and ignore those consumers who slipped onto default schemes previously and found themselves being ripped off. This government, this government took the action to reform the way in which the retail energy market works to ensure that there is, there is accountability there in terms of the prices those households are offered. And estimates show in the early days that households are $190 better off as a result of those reforms. Just those reforms to those in the default market. Oh, Senator, w Senator Wong wants to be there with gratuitous order, advice Senator in Birmingham. the end because they did nothing. Time order. Senators Wong and Birmingham, order on my left. Uh, Senator uh, Cormann. As much as I enjoy the continued disorderly interjections from the Leader of Opposition, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Senator Patrick. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to threats made by a CFMEU official uh, towards myself, Senator Griff and uh, um, Senator Lambie over the weekend. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. Mr President, Senators may be aware of media reports over the weekend relating to threats made to me, Senator Griff and Senator Lambie by Mr Setka in relation to a, uh, to a pending vote in this chamber on the Ensuring Integrity Bill. No senator should ever be threatened or intimidated uh, in relation to a vote. Lobbied, challenged on the merits, presented with contrary views and criticised, yes, threatened, no. This is a very serious matter. Senators Griff, Lambie and I are giving careful consideration to what action will be, uh, we will uh, take uh, in relation to the threat. Uh, under consideration are a number of options, including referral to the Privileges Committee, referral to the, to the police, inviting Mr Setka to appear before the Education and Employment Committee to explain his remarks. It will likely be a combination of these things. There should be zero tolerance for anyone who seeks to influence a senator's vote by way of threat, and this is a matter, uh, and in this particular matter, um, we, will, we, we can't possibly leave this unattended. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to John Setka. Leave is granted. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to support the statement from Senator Patrick regarding the conduct of Mr John Setka. To seek to influence a vote in this chamber by threat or intimidation is completely inappropriate. I dish it out myself a fair bit in this place, so I cannot be complaining when it comes back in my direction. But the comments attributed to Mr Secker in recent reports are entirely beyond the pale. Politics can be brutal, but it should never become violent. We are closely examining what options are available to us to ensure that this kind of intimidation gets a, re gets a response it so rightfully deserves. My vote will never be determined by, by who bullies me the most. I won't be swayed by threats or the people who make them. But allowing these threats to go unanswered is no longer an option. 
I won't be saying any further. I won't be saying anything further on the matter until we have determined the most appropriate course of action. To John, I can only appeal to whatever is left of your sense of decency and honour, and ask you consider doing what is plainly in the best interests of your members and your union members. And I will urge you once again to stand down and resign. Thanks, senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by, given by Senator Cormann to questions asked by Senator Gallagher, Senator Keneally, Senator Wong and me. The Prime Minister has two responsibilities that sit above all else. The first is to provide national prosperity, and we all know that he is failing miserably at this. But today we have also seen that he is failing at the second. And that second duty is his duty to provide national security. It is his duty as Prime Minister to ensure that all Australians are safe. How can you be the government of the day and ignore the advice of our national security agencies? It's irresponsible at best, dangerous at worst. And those opposite are scrambling so fast to contain this that they are now playing one of the lowest cards one can play in public life and that is the race card. But actually, the last refuge of the scoundrel is proving to be the Liberal National Party room, because the only person linking these specific and serious concerns about Ms Liu to the, to the entire Chinese-Australian population is the Prime Minister, and he should stop. National security agencies do not make decisions, nor do they give advice, because they're racist. And let's go to a recent speech by the outgoing Director General of ASIO, Duncan Lewis. Mr Lewis warned in that speech that foreign interference and espionage is proving to be the, an existential threat to our country. What he said is, it's my view that currently the issue of espionage and foreign interference is by far and away the most serious issue going forward. Covert attempts to influence and shape the views of the public media, government and diaspora communities, both within Australia and overseas, is now with us every day. Unlike the immediacy of terrorism incidents, the harm from acts of espionage may not present for years, even decades, after the activity has occurred. These sorts of activities are typically quiet and insidious with a long tail. He then went on to talk about the existential threat that they posed to the nation, noting that part of the danger was it was more subtle and difficult to recognise than the threat of terrorism. The ABC has reported that the office of former Prime Minister Turnbull received advice from ASIO Director General Duncan Lewis, as he then was, that Mr Turnbull should not attend a meet and greet organised by Ms Liu uh, following vetting of the guest list by ASIO. That is from one of our security agencies. There is no racism in what ASIO and its fellow, its sister uh, agencies do and the work and the advice that they give. So under the Prime Minister's test, the question is, is Mr Lewis a racist? That is the question. And of course he is not. Need I remind this place who voted on a motion to say it's OK to be white, or who lined up to congratulate former Senator Fraser Anning after he invoked the final solution when talking about immigration policy? The Prime Minister loves to remind us all that the Liberal Party is the party of Menzies. But we're not buying what the Prime Minister is selling. Robert Menzies would be turning in his grave. Now, this whole sordid affair has come about because of the Liberal Party's quite unbelievable decision to pre-select Ms Liu, knowing full well the concerns that existed around her associations. As a Victorian Liberal MP said to me rather gloomily late last week, she was pre-selected with everyone hoping she wouldn't win because then she'd be done and would never be able to run again. Gladys Liu is not a new player on the political scene. 
She has been an active member of the Victorian Liberal Party for many, many years. She is notorious for raising enormous amounts of money, but she is also notorious for being a loose cannon. She has a questionable work history, has brought vast unexplained wealth to the Liberal Party and comes to this place with more baggage than Louis Vuitton. Just ask her Victorian colleagues. She's a money machine. She's the LNP's own personal ATM from Whitehorse Road, and that's why she sits in this place. That's why she was pre-selected. Pre because, it's, let's face it, it's clearly not due to her strong media performances. Ms Liu's Victorian colleagues should be sharing what they know about Ms Liu with the Prime Minister, because the truth is you don't know what you don't know, and you should be very, very careful. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Thank you. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to take note um, of the matters raised by Senator Kitching, and it is with some amusement. It's a strange word to use, I accept, in the circumstances, because security is such an important subject. And yet, here we are with almost every question in question time being raised by the opposition, dealing with these slurs against Ms Liu in circumstances where the emperor really doesn't have any clothes. And we need only look to some of the coverage that this issue has received over the last few days to get a sense of just how um, empty the Labor Party's approach is at the moment. They don't have any substance on the economy, so they want to talk about this. They don't have any substance when it comes to climate policy. They're divided, they're confused. Some of them want to keep a 45 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030. That's Ms Plibersek. Others want to change and go to a 2050 net zero pollution target, like Mr Conroy. Mr Butler wants to ditch the 45 per cent, but in favour of what? Who knows? Mr Fitzgibbon says we need to talk about the elephant in the room, our, our dud policy on climate, but nobody really knows what to replace it with. If we can just talk about Ms Liu enough, maybe no one will notice that we're saying, oh look, a unicorn, and asking people to look in the other direction. Because the truth is, they've got nothing in the cupboard. Now, it goes without saying, we are doing the heavy lifting on these difficult issues, getting the balance right between our need for economic development and our need for environmental protection. We are getting on with the job in a no-nonsense, no-grandstanding kind of way, exceeding Kyoto targets, meeting our Paris commitments, doing it all with a growing economy rather than devastating it, like Labor's 45 per cent emissions reduction target would have. But all of this goes to the heart of the matter, and that is Labor has got nothing to offer. They're the same on the economy too. They don't know what they want. Do they still want a high tax, high spend agenda? Or are they going to listen, listen to the Australians who said, that just isn't the way we work? Well, at the moment, they don't know. So again, they point to the, the unicorn over there. Quick, look, look over there, because they've got nothing to offer. Now, Ms Liu, she's a, a first-term MP. I've only been in this place a short period of time. I know how nerve-wracking it can be to be a new person in this place, to do media interviews. It can be a tough thing to do. And she gave a clumsy interview. It's a, it's a tricky thing to do. But let's not pretend, even for a second, that that means anything like what the circumstances of former Senator Dastyari looked like. Those were a wildly, wildly different situation. Now, let's, let's have a look at the facts here. Ms Liu is a woman of Chinese heritage, born in Hong Kong. She came here with just two suitcases and has started a life for herself. She's overcome disability. She's overcome domestic violence. She's overcome so many of the barriers that people from different races in this country face as they try and be heard in the public square. And yet she's done it. And she has made it all the way to the Parliament of Australia in what is really a milestone. She's run a small business. She's come here to get an education. She's created something beautiful 
for her and her family. And you know what? That speaks to the stories of the 1.2 million Australians of Chinese heritage who have made their home here, who do it with a loyalty to Australia, who do it understanding where they've come from, acknowledging that culture, and often involved in organisations that reflect their connection to that culture, but with their heart here in Australia. And that's one of the really exciting things about a multicultural Australia something that shouldn't be turned into a cheap shot. It's very different to anything that could be compared to Mr Dastyari's situation. She hasn't got anybody to pay her personal expenses. She hasn't got foreign nationals to do that. She hasn't changed her positions on issues, doing the bidding of people from another nation. She hasn't done it using the crest of this place. Nope. She's a Hong Kong-born Australian doing her best to represent the people of Chisholm to the best of her ability in this place. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. Every day there are new questions raised about the member for Chisholm's affiliations in the past, uh, her actions, her work history and the donations that she solicited in the Victorian Liberal Party. Every day the government ducks and weaves away from all of these questions. Every day, those opposite try to evade responsibility for what's going on with the member for Chisholm and what the Prime Minister knew and when. We call on the Prime Minister and Gladys Liu to come clean on uh, the donations facilitated by her, by her own account, uh, which were, she claims, very substantial. And we call on her and the Prime Minister to come clean about her past affiliations. The best place for the member for Chisholm to do that is in the parliament. Uh, it certainly didn't go very well on Sky the other night. And the interview on Sky the other night wasn't the clumsy interview of a first-term backbencher. I've done a few of those myself recently. And when asked questions about what organisations she's been a member of, she did not tell the truth. Uh, when she was asked questions about what the Australian position should be in relation to the South China Sea, she refused to commit herself to a position. It's not clumsy. Uh, it's far worse than that. She should make a full and complete statement about what's happened. There are strong indications from the material that is now in the public domain that the Prime Minister put winning a marginal seat and internal Victorian factional considerations ahead of Australia's national security. The Prime Minister's response is to smear all those who want answers about the affiliations and the donations swirling around the member for Chisholm with a disgraceful allegation that the questions are motivated by racist antipathy towards the Chinese community or opportunism. The counterfactual is nobody should ever ask questions about the member for Chisholm. And I don't think that's acceptable in this place. On this side, we take national security seriously and our obligations to uphold the duties of parliamentarians to unequivocally stand up for the national interest. This week again, like last week, there are no plans for the government to deal with the economic challenges that face the country. No economic policy, no energy policy and no climate change policy. The catalogue of zero government policy is seemingly endless. And there are real clouds over the integrity of the Prime Minister who said on Friday that he had never used the term Shanghai Sam in relation to the conduct of former Senator Dastyari. He did use that term, with all of its dog-whistling connotations, 17 times, including four times in a single sentence, which is a remarkable thing to achieve. At the time he was making it, the Prime Minister thought that the smear against former Senator Dastyari was a real hit. All of the blustering, bullying, bloviating boy from Bondi's behaviour was on full view, all there for everybody to see. Not so much now, it seems. If there are any sensible people left on the other side of the parliament, they should give the Prime Minister a bit of advice. If your only defence of the indefensible, is to smear your opponents, then you'd better come to the debate with clean hands. The Prime Minister's hands are filthy. 
We have a Prime Minister who's failing when it comes to integrity. The only person in this conversation who is trying to pretend that what is going on around Gladys Liu is about an entire community is the Prime Minister. And we know that because he's running the paid ads on WeChat already. It's offensive, it's absurd, it's opportunist, and unfortunately for the Prime Minister, it is true to form. All we are asking for, all the community is asking for, is an assurance from the Prime Minister that Ms Liu is a fit and proper person to stand in the Australian Parliament and that he hasn't put winning a marginal seat and uh, putrid Victorian factional politics ahead of Australia's national security. The member for Chisholm should rise in the parliament, in the House of Representatives this afternoon, and make a full account uh, of these matters. Uh, and, uh, and she should do it this afternoon, and she should do it without delay. Thank you, Senator Ayres. I just remind you also, um, when referring to those in the other place, to always use their correct title. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, well, I rise to, to take note of uh, various questions. And Senator Ayres, I had some hope when you asked your question. You, you actually asked a policy question in this place from the other side. A policy question. And uh, you know, it's been so long since we've heard a policy question from those opposite. Uh, it, it was such a relief. But now, at taking note, we get, uh, we get uh, to the point where we're back to the uh, same old inside the beltway, politics for the sake of politics uh, from the Labor Party that we've seen so often. And, and Labor has form in this area. Labor has form, and I find it uh, almost extraordinary that they, they are the ones who want to bring up Sam Dastiari. Now, we heard from Sam, Senator Cormann earlier. We heard uh, of, of uh, some of the exploits of that particular individual uh, in the past and some of the activities that he uh, was involved in that led to his uh, eventual departure from this place. And for the Labor Party, who has got such form in this area, to be running these sorts of lines is quite extraordinary. This attack on a single coalition <laughs> member of parliament to muddy the waters on their own pretty shabby dealings. Uh, we've all heard Labor's uh, new policy, new policy to ban, ban plastic bags. It's not an environmental policy, it's a donation policy. But uh, Labor Party has got a track record of using uh, these sort of thinly veiled xenophobic attacks uh, against uh, those they don't like. Um, talking about the Adani coal mine, the member for Sydney said, and I quote, you cannot rely on an Indian mining company to bring jobs to central and north Queensland. We all remember Michael Daly's claims about Asians with PhDs taking jobs. We all remember Luke Foley talking about white flight. And we all remember the union and labour campaigns against the China-Australia free trade agreement. We remember that ad that appeared the paid advertisement on TV featuring a, well, let's say a Caucasian family sitting around a dining table, the mum folding the laundry, talking about the China Free Trade Agreement. This is pretty thin, pretty sad stuff from the Labor movement and from the Australian Labor Party. Now, uh, the member for Chisholm addressed some of these potential happenings in her maiden speech, in, set, in fact. She said, I don't underestimate the enormity of being the first Chinese-born member of this place, and I know some people will see everything I do through the lens of my birthplace. But I hope they will see more than just the first Chinese woman elected to this place. I hope they will see me as a strong advocate for everyone in Chisholm. Chisholm is where my heart is. And I think uh, Senator Cormann really belled the cat when he talked about the fact that the, uh, the, the, the Labor candidate for Chisholm was a member of many of the same organisations that are, are currently uh, are the, the, um, the cause for the attack on the current member for Chisholm. Uh, it, it really does call out those opposite for their uh, lack of focus on policy, for their desire to attack a, a single coalition uh, backbencher. 
you know, a backbencher who, in a, in, a, in a clumsy interview, and I think that is the best word for it, and yes, we have all been around here when, early in our careers when we've perhaps given interviews where we haven't quite got the words out correctly. And uh, I think we can all very much feel for that. But uh, Ms Liu has made it very clear in subsequent statements, including statements to parliament, uh, that uh, she did uh, choose her words poorly during that interview uh, and that uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the declarations matter that she has compli complied with all relevant state and federal disclosure laws. So uh, I would call on those opposite to really consider what they're doing with this current attack on a single member of parliament. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is not a... Uh, particularly edifying example of the way this chamber or this parliament should behave, and I certainly would ask all members opposite to reflect on that. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, Senator M. Smith, thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take note of the answers given to questions by Senators Wong, Gallagher, Keneally and Kitching today. And whilst members of the government have dismissed the saga surrounding the member for Chisholm as that of a conspiracy theory, senators on this side believe it is time that the inconsistencies that we keep getting are addressed head on. As members and senators of parliament elected to this place by the Australian people, we hold a very unique responsibility to the people that we represent. It is a responsibility of trust and transparency in the work that we undertake. It is a heavy responsibility held by all of us, none more or less than any other. Because all of us are required to make decisions that are in the best interests of our communities, our states and our country. Most of all when these decisions include overseas or foreign influences. And when inconsistencies regarding these matters emerge, it is fair for questions to be asked, seeking clarif clarification and explanations. That is all that my colleagues on this side of the chamber sought to do in question time today. And the suggestion that their questions have been motivated by anything other than that, I have to say, is deeply offensive and just ridiculous. Now, during the last few weeks, we have heard, seen and read successive reports in the media, in the Senate and in the other place regarding the member for Chisholm. It has been well canvassed that on Tuesday night, the member for Chisholm agreed to an interview with Andrew Bolt in an effort to clear her name on these issues. And it's probably not the program that I would have chosen to go on, but it's the program that she went on. And I sympathise, as someone new to this profession, as some of my colleagues have said today as well, that early interviews can be quite challenging. But this wasn't just first interview nerves, and it was more than a clumsy interview. It was a train wreck. Because during this interview, the member for Chisholm raised more questions in every answer that she gave. Indeed, the member for Chisholm couldn't explain her association with numerous organisations of concern. On three occasions during the interview, she failed to commit herself to the bipartisan position on the South China Sea. This is more than clumsy. And the Prime Minister and the government surely know it. But you would not think so because in question time on Wednesday last week, the Prime Minister refused to assure Australians that the member for Chisholm was a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, in Senate question time last Wednesday, refused to assure Australians that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. And today we have heard continued refusals from Senator Cormann to assure Australians that the member for Chisholm is a fit and proper person to serve in the Australian Parliament. On Thursday last week, there were extraordinary reports that senior Liberals were warned by security agencies regarding concerns about the member for Chisholm and her links to the Chinese Communist Party. As Senator Keneally reminded Senator Cormann in a question today, one government MP is quoted, there should have been concerns when she was being chosen to stand as a candidate and I believe those concerns were ignored. This raises very serious questions as to whether the Prime Minister and the Liberal Party put winning marginal heats, seats ahead of Australia's national security. All of this goes far beyond a clumsy interview. It goes to questions regarding the national interest. 
The Prime Minister needs to demonstrate to the Australian people what steps he took to ensure the member for Chisholm was a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. He should explain what he knew about these reports and when he knew it. It's time for answers, not more inconsistency, from a saga that has been riddled with inconsistency after inconsistency. Because our responsibilities here as members of parliament and as representatives of the Australian people are rightly heavy responsibilities. Australians need to know that these responsibilities are being met. And the member for Chisholm has a responsibility too to address the inconsistencies that keep rolling in, including to the other questions raised today about the double checking process that she is reportedly going through. She should do that by making a full and complete statement in the Australian Parliament. Again, this is about inconsistencies. Questions have been asked. They need to be addressed. It's time for answers from the member for Chisholm and from the Prime Minister. It's time for the inconsistencies to be cleared up. Thank you, Senator Smith. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise uh, today to um, give note of the answers given to my question from uh, Senator Cormann representing the Prime Minister. In relation to the water crisis facing the Murray-Darling Basin, and we know that this is a river system that is in absolute crisis, an environmental collapse is looming once more, and we know that uh, farms and farming communities have their back against the wall. And now we understand that communities throughout the basin are struggling to even be able to turn on the tap and get clean drinking water. And this is a disaster, an absolute crisis. And it has happened on the watch of the National Party having the water portfolio. This government, the coalition government, has for six years mismanaged the Murray-Darling Basin. They have mismanaged the country's most precious water resource. They've prioritised the profits of big corporate irrigators, particularly those up in the north, and they've prioritised those who continue to fund electoral and political donations to the National Party. Meanwhile, small family farmers go without Communities are now struggling to even access basic clean water, and the environment is teetering on the brink of collapse. It is a disaster, and it's happened on the watch of the National Party. And of course, what do we hear from the Water Minister? Well, only last week, Mr. David Littleproud, the Water Minister and Nationals member at the Cabinet table, said he wasn't even sure if climate change was man-made. Now, let's not forget, not only is Mr Littleproud in charge of the nation's water policy and the management of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, he's also in charge of natural disasters. He's in charge of drought policy in this country, and the bloke doesn't even believe in climate change or the science that underpins any way of how we deal with this going forward. I'll tell you what's going on in the Murray-Darling Basin right now. It is a mess created by the National Party. Their lack of understanding about climate change, their backing of big corporate irrigators over everybody else, and their insistence that their head-in-the-sand approach on coal and carbon pollution in this country will have no impact on the drought or on the climate in the future. You know what's killing the Murray-Darling Basin right now? Cotton, coal and climate change. That's what's killing the Murray-Darling Basin. That's why we have farmers with their backs against the wall, because this government is in denial. They've done nothing. It's time they got a real drought policy that took into consideration what they need to do on climate change 
and to start reining in the over-extraction of our water supply by big corporate interests. And of course, many of these corporate interests, let's not forget, Madam Deputy President, are big foreign agriculture companies that have no care for the local communities in which they operate. Their profits go overseas, and the people who run these places don't even, don't even live in the areas in which they're draining water from. And then we've got the water barons who have now come into the market. The prices are now spiked so high that everyday users in the system, small family farms, can't even afford their water licences. They can't afford the water to water their stock or their crops. And what do we get from this minister? You know what? Not my fault, but everyone, if we just pray for rain, hopefully the system will get better. Hopefully the problem will be solved. Well, we need a whole lot more than hopes and prayers to fix the Murray-Darling Basin. We need a properly managed system, a drought policy that takes into consideration climate change, and a minister that is not up to his neck in doing the deeds for big corporate irrigators and their political donations. That's what we need. The sooner the National Party are forced to hand over the water portfolio, the sooner we can get on with fixing our river system for good. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.